Chapter 16, Part 6 of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 2, by John Fox. Edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter 16. Persecutions in England during the reign of Queen Mary. Part 6. The death of Edward in 1553 exposed Cranmer to all the rage of his enemies. Though the archbishop was among those who supported Mary's accession, he was attained at the meeting of Parliament, and in November adjudged guilty of high treason at Guildhall, and degraded from his dignities. He sent a humble letter to Mary, explaining the cause of his signing the will in favor of Edward, and in 1554 he wrote to the council, whom he pressed to obtain a pardon from the Queen, by a letter delivered to Dr. Weston, but which the letter opened, and on seeing its contents, basely returned. Treason was a charge quite inapplicable to Cranmer, who supported the Queen's right, while others, who had favored Lady Jane, were dismissed upon paying a small fine. A calumny was now spread against Cramner that he complied with some of the popish ceremonies to ingratiate himself with the Queen, which he dared publicly disavow, and justified his articles of faith. The active part which the prelate had taken in the divorce of Mary's mother had ever rankled deeply in the heart of the Queen, and revenge formed a prominent feature in the death of Cramner. We have in this work noticed the public disputations at Oxford, in which the talents of Cranmer, Ridley, and Latimer shone so conspicuously, and tended to their condemnation. The first sentence was illegal, inasmuch as the usurped power of the Pope had not yet been re-established by law. Being kept in prison until this was effected, a commission was dispatched from Rome, appointing Dr. Brooks to sit as the representative of His Holiness, and Doctors Story and Martin as those of the Queen. Cranmer was willing to bow to the authority of Doctors Story and Martin, but against that of Dr. Brooks he protested. Such were the remarks and replies of Cranmer, after a long examination, that Dr. Brooks observed, We come to examine you, and methinks you examine us. Being sent back to confinement, he received a citation to appear at Rome within eighteen days, but this was impracticable, as he was imprisoned in England. And as he stated, even had he been at liberty, he was too poor to employ an advocate. Absurd as it must appear, Cranmer was condemned at Rome, and on February 14, 1556, a new commission was appointed, by which Thurlby, Bishop of Eli, and Bonner of London, were deputed to sit in judgment at Christ Church, Oxford. By virtue of this instrument, Cranmer was gradually degraded, by putting mere rags on him to represent the dress of an archbishop, then stripping him of his attire, they took off his own gown, and put an old worn one upon him instead. This he bore unmoved, and his enemies, finding that severity only rendered him more determined, tried the opposite course, and placed him in the house of the dean of Christchurch, where he was treated with every indulgence. This presented such a contrast to the three years' hard imprisonment he had received, that it threw him off his guard. His open, generous nature was more easily to be seduced by a liberal conduct than by threats and fetters. When Satan finds the Christian proof against one mode of attack, he tries another. And what form is so seductive as smiles, rewards, and power, after a long, painful imprisonment? Thus it was with Cranmer. His enemies promised him his former greatness if he would but recant, as well as the Queen's favor, and this at the very time that they knew his death was determined in council. To soften the path to apostasy, the first paper brought forth for his signature was conceived in general terms. This one signed, five others were obtained as explanatory of the first, until finally he put his hand to the following detestable instrument. I, Thomas Cranmer, late Archbishop of Canterbury, do renounce, abhor, and detest all manner of heresies and errors of Luther and Zuinglius, and all other teachings which are contrary to sound and true doctrine. And I believe most constantly in my heart, and with my mouth I confess one holy and Catholic Church visible, without which there is no salvation, 
and therefore I acknowledge the bishop of Rome to be supreme head on earth, whom I acknowledge to be the highest bishop and pope, and Christ's vicar, unto whom all Christian people ought to be subject. And as concerning the sacraments, I believe and worship in the sacrament of the altar, the body, and blood of Christ, being contained most truly under the forms of bread and wine, the bread through the mighty power of God being turned into the body of our Saviour Jesus Christ, and the wine into his blood. And in the other six sacraments also, alike as in this, I believe and hold as the universal church holdeth, and the church of Rome judgeth and determineth. Furthermore, I believe that there is a place of purgatory, where souls departed be punished for a time, for whom the church doth godly and wholesomely pray, like it doth honor saints and make prayers to them. Finally, in all things I profess, that I do not otherwise believe than the Catholic Church and the Church of Rome holdeth and teacheth. I am sorry that I ever held or thought otherwise, and I beseech Almighty God, that of His mercy He will vouchsafe to forgive me whatsoever I have offended against God or His Church, and also I desire and beseech all Christian people to pray for me. And all such as have been deceived either by mine example or doctrine, I require them by the blood of Jesus Christ that they will return to the unity of the church, that we may be all one of mind, without schism or division. And to conclude, as I submit myself to the Catholic Church of Christ, and to the supreme head thereof, so I submit myself to the most excellent majesties of Philip and Mary, King and Queen of this realm of England, etc., and to all other their laws and ordinances, being ready always as a faithful subject ever to obey them. And God is my witness that I have not done this for favor or fear of any person, but willingly and of mine own conscience, as to the instructions of others. Let him that standeth take heed lest he fall, said the Apostle, and here was a falling off indeed. The Papists now triumphed in their turn. They had acquired all they wanted short of his life. His recantation was immediately printed and dispersed, that it might have its due effect upon the astonished Protestants. But God counterworked all the designs of the Catholics by the extent to which they carry the implacable persecutions of their prey. Doubtless the love of life induced Cranmer to sign the above declaration. Yet death may be said to have been preferable to life to him who lay under the stings of a goaded conscience and the contempt of every gospel Christian. This principle he strongly felt in all its force and anguish. The Queen's revenge was only to be satisfied by Cranmer's blood, and therefore she wrote an order to Dr. Pohl to prepare a sermon to be preached March 21st, directly before his martyrdom, at St. Mary's, Oxford. Dr. Pohl visited him on the day previous, and was induced to believe that he would publicly deliver his sentiments in confirmation of the articles to which he had subscribed. About nine in the morning on the day of the sacrifice, the Queen's commissioners, attended by the magistrates, conducted the amiable unfortunate to St. Mary's Church. His torn, dirty garb, the same in which they habited him upon his degradation, excited the commiseration of the people. In the church he found a low, mean stage, erected opposite to the pulpit, on which, being placed, he turned his face and fervently prayed to God. The church was crowded with persons of both persuasions, expecting to hear the justification of the late apostasy. The Catholics rejoicing and the Protestants deeply wounded in spirit at the deceit of the human heart. Dr. Pohl, in his sermon, represented Cranmer as having been guilty of the most atrocious crimes, encouraged the deluded sufferer not to fear death, not to doubt the support of God in his torments, nor that masses would be said in all the churches of Oxford for the repose of his soul. The doctor then noticed his conversion, and which he ascribed to the evident working of almighty power, and in order that the people might be convinced of its reality, asked the prisoner to give them a sign. This Cranmer did, and begged the congregation to pray for him, for he had committed many grievous sins, but of all there was one which awfully lay upon his mind, of which he would speak shortly. During the sermon Cranmer wept bitter tears, lifting up his hands and eyes to heaven, and letting them fall, as if unworthy to live. His grief now found vent in words. Before his confession he fell upon his knees, and in the following words unveiled the deep contrition and agitation which harrowed up his soul. 
O Father of heaven, O Son of God, Redeemer of the world, O Holy Ghost, three persons, all one God, have mercy on me, most wretched, caitiff, and miserable sinner. I have offended both against heaven and earth, more than my tongue can express. Whither then may I go, or whither may I flee? To heaven I may be ashamed to lift up mine eyes, and in earth I find no place of refuge or succor. To thee, therefore, O Lord, do I run. To thee do I humble myself, saying, O Lord, my God, my sins be great, but yet have mercy upon me for thy great mercy. The great mystery that God became man was not wrought for little or few offenses. Thou didst not give thy Son, O Heavenly Father, unto death for small sins only, but for all the greatest sins of the world, so that the sinner return to thee with his whole heart, as I do present. Wherefore have mercy on me, O God, whose property is always to have mercy. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for thy great mercy. I crave nothing for my own merits, but for thy name's sake, that it may be hallowed hereby, and for thy dear Son, Jesus Christ's sake. And now, therefore, O Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, etc. Then rising, he said he was desirous before his death to give them some pious exhortations by which God might be glorified and themselves edified. He then descanted upon the danger of a love for the world, the duty of obedience to their majesties, love to one another, and the necessity of the rich administering to the wants of the poor. He quoted the three verses of the fifth chapter of James, and then proceeded, Let them that be rich ponder well these three sentences, for if they ever had occasion to show their charity, they have it now at this present, the poor people being so many, and the victuals so dear. And now for as much as I am come to the last end of my life, whereupon hangeth all my life past, and all my life to come, either to live with my master Christ for ever in joy, or else to be in pain for ever with the wicked in hell. And I see before mine eyes presently, either heaven ready to receive me, or else hell ready to swallow me up. I shall therefore declare unto you my very faith how I believe, without any color of dissimulation. For now is no time to dissimul, whatsoever I have said or written in times past. First, I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, etc., and I believe every article of the Catholic faith, every word and sentence taught by our Savior Jesus Christ, his apostles and prophets, in the New and Old Testament. And now I come to the great thing which so much troubleth my conscience, more than anything that I ever did or said in my whole life, and that is the setting abroad of a writing contrary to the truth, which now here I renounce and refuse, as things written with my hand contrary to the truth which I thought in my heart, and written for fear of death and to save my life, if it might be. And that is, all such bills or papers which I have written or signed with my hand since my degradation, wherein I have written many things untrue. And forasmuch as my hand hath offended, writing contrary to my heart, therefore my hand shall first be punished, for when I come to the fire it shall first be burned. And as for the Pope, I refuse him as Christ's enemy and Antichrist, with all his false doctrine. Upon the conclusion of this unexpected declaration, amazement and indignation were conspicuous in every part of the church. The Catholics were completely foiled, their object being frustrated, Cranmer, like Samson, having completed a greater ruin upon his enemies in the hour of death than he did in his life. Cranmer would have proceeded in the exposure of the popish doctrines, but the murmurs of the idolaters drowned his voice and the preacher gave an order to lead the heretic away. The savage command was directly obeyed, and the lamb about to suffer was torn from his stand to the place of slaughter, insulted all the way by the revilings and taunts of the pestilent monks and friars. With thoughts intent upon a far higher object than the empty threats of man, he reached the spot dyed with the blood of Ridley and Latimer. There he knelt for a short time in earnest devotion, and then arose, that he might undress and prepare for the fire. Two friars who had been parties in prevailing upon him to abjure now endeavored to draw him off again from the truth. But he was steadfast and immovable in what he had just professed and publicly taught. A chain was provided to bind him to the stake, and after it had tightly encircled him, fire was put to the fuel, and the flames began soon to ascend. Then were the glorious sentiments of the martyr made manifest. 
Then it was that, stretching out his right hand, he held it unshrinkingly in the fire until it was burnt to a cinder, even before his body was injured, frequently exclaiming, This unworthy right hand! His body did abide the burning with such steadfastness that he seemed to have no more than the stake to which he was bound. His eyes were lifted up to heaven, and he repeated this unworthy right hand as long as his voice would suffer him, and using often the words of Stephen, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, in the greatness of the flame, he gave up the ghost. THE VISION OF THREE LADDERS When Robert Samuel was brought forth to be burned, certain there were that heard him declare what strange things had happened unto him during the time of his imprisonment to wit that after he had famished or pined with hunger two or three days together he then fell into a sleep as it were one half in a slumber at which time one clad in all white seemed to stand before him who ministered comfort unto him by these words samuel samuel be of good cheer and take a good heart unto thee for after this day shalt thou never be either hungry or thirsty. No less memorable it is, and worthy to be noted, concerning the three ladders which he told to divers he saw in his sleep, set up toward heaven, of the which there was one somewhat longer than the rest, but yet at length they became one, joining, as it were, all three together. As this godly martyr was going to the fire, there came a certain maid to him, which took him about the neck and kissed him, who, being marked by them that were present, was sought for the next day after, to be had to prison and burned, as the very party herself informed me. Howbeit, as God of his goodness would have it, she escaped their fiery hands, keeping herself secret in the town a good while after. But as this maid, called Rose Nottingham, was marvelously preserved by the providence of God, so there were other two honest women who did fall into the rage and fury of that time. The one was a brewer's wife, the other was a shoemaker's wife, but both together now espoused to a new husband, Christ. With these two was this maid aforesaid very familiar and well acquainted, who on a time giving counsel to one of them, that she should convey herself away while she had time and space, had this answer at her hand again. I know well, saith she, that it is lawful enough to fly away, which remedy you may use if you list but my case standeth otherwise. I am tied to a husband, and have besides young children at home. Therefore I am minded, for the love of Christ and his truth, to stand to the extremity of the matter. And so the next day after Samuel suffered, these two godly wives, the one called Anne Potten, the other called Joan Trunchfield, the wife of Michael Trunchfield, shoemaker of Ipswich, were apprehended, and had both into one prison together. As they were both by sex and nature somewhat tender, so were they at first less able to endure the straightness of the prison. And especially the brewer's wife was cast into marvelous great agonies of trouble of mind thereby. But Christ, beholding the weak infirmity of his servant, did not fail to help her when she was in this necessity. So at length they both suffered after Samuel in 1556, February 19th. And these, no doubt, were those two ladders, which, being joined with the third, Samuel saw stretched up into heaven. This blessed Samuel, the servant of Christ, suffered the 31st of August, 1555. The report goeth among some that were present, and saw him burn, that his body in burning did shine in the eyes of them that stood by, as bright and white as their new-tried silver. When Agnes Bongior saw herself separated from her prison fellows, what piteous moan that good woman made, how bitterly she wept, what strange thoughts came into her mind, how naked and desolate she esteemed herself, and into what plunge of despair and care her poor soul was brought. It was piteous and wonderful to see. Which all came because she went not with them to give her life in the defense of her Christ. For of all things in the world, life was least looked for at her hands. For that morning in which she was kept back from burning, she had put on a smock that she had prepared only for that purpose, and also having a child, a little young infant, sucking on her, whom she kept with her tenderly all the time that she was in prison. Against that day likewise did she send away to another nurse, and prepare herself presently to give herself for the testimony of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. So little did she look for life, and so greatly did God's gifts work in her above nature, 
that death seemed a great deal better welcome than life. After which she began a little to stay herself, and gave her whole exercise to reading and prayer, wherein she found no little comfort. In a short time came a writ from London for the burning, which, according to the effect thereof, was executed. Hugh Laverick and John a Priest. Here we perceive that neither the impotence of age nor the affliction of blindness could turn aside the murdering fames of these Babylonish monsters. The first of these unfortunates was of the parish of Barking, aged sixty-eight, a painter and a cripple. The other was blind, dark indeed in his visual facilities, but intellectually illuminated with the radiance of the everlasting gospel of truth. Inoffensive objects like these were informed against by some of the sons of bigotry, and dragged before the prelatical shark of London, where they underwent examination, and replied to the articles propounded to them, as other Christian martyrs had done before. On the ninth day of May, in the consistory of St. Paul's, they were entreated to recant, and upon refusal, were sent to Fulham, where Bonner, by way of a dessert after dinner, condemned them to the agonies of the fire. Being consigned to the secular officers, May 15, 1556, they were taken in a cart from Newgate to stratford le where they were fastened to the stake. When Hugh Laverick was secured by the chain, having no further occasion for his crutch, he threw it away, saying to his fellow martyr, while consoling him, Be of good cheer, my brother, for my Lord of London is our good physician. He will heal us both shortly, thee of thy blindness, and me of my lameness. They sank down in the fire to rise to immortality. The day after the above martyrdoms, Catherine Hutt of Bocking, widow, Joan Horns, spinster, of Balerica, Elizabeth Thackwell, spinster, of Great Bursted, suffered death in Smithfield. Thomas Dowry We have again to record an act of unpitying cruelty exercised on this lad, whom Bishop Hooper had confirmed in the Lord and the knowledge of his word. How long this poor sufferer remained in prison is uncertain. By the testimony of one John Paler, Register of Gloucester, we learn that when Dowry was brought before Dr. Williams, then Chancellor of Gloucester, the usual articles were presented him for subscription. From these he dissented, and upon the doctor's demanding of whom and where he had learned his heresies, the youth replied, Indeed, Mr. Chancellor, I learned them from you in that very pulpit. On such a day, naming the day, you said, in preaching upon the sacrament, that it was to be exercised spiritually by faith, and not carnally and really, as taught by the papists. Dr. Williams then bid him recant as he had done, but Dowry had not so learned his duty. Though you, he said, can so easily mock God, the world, and your own conscience, yet will I not do so. Preservation of George Crow and His Testament This poor man of Malden, May 26, 1556, put to sea to laid in lint with Fuller's earth, but the boat, being driven on land, filled with water, and everything was washed out of her. Crow, however, saved his testament, and coveted nothing else. With Crow was a man and a boy, whose awful situation became every minute more alarming, as the boat was useless, and they were ten miles from land, expecting the tide should in a few hours set in upon them. After prayer to God, they got up on the mast and hung there for the space of ten hours, when the poor boy, overcome by cold and exhaustion, fell off and was drowned. The tide having abated, Crow proposed to take down the masts and float upon them, which they did, and at ten o'clock at night they were borne away at the mercy of the waves. On Wednesday, in the night, Crow's companion died through the fatigue and hunger, and he was left alone, calling upon God for succor. At length he was picked up by a Captain Morse bound to Antwerp, who had nearly steered away, taking him for some fisherman's buoy floating in the sea. As soon as Crow was got on board, he put his hand in his bosom, and drew out his testament, which indeed was wet, but not otherwise injured. At Antwerp he was well received, and the money he had lost was more than made good to him. End of chapter 16, part 6